Okay, so, and you know, the theory of management teaches you those things, opportunities and threats. But what I realized in my experience is that whenever people do that SWOT analysis of strengths and weaknesses, they don't do it from a point of deep research. They try and guess what they are, and they pick the obvious ones. But there may be some latent or hidden ones that only come from engaging people, um, asking for feedback. And if you, are, if you have a business where you employ people, you must involve the people you work with in doing that exercise because they will help you see the reality of your strengths and weaknesses. When it comes to opportunities and threats as well, they'll tell you do a personal analysis and do a this and do a that. They are all very good techniques for helping you discover opportunities and threats. But what I say to the simple business person is, look in the environment you operate in and think about the things that are not within your control but can affect your business positively or negatively. Excuse me, what was your name? I didn't ask your name. I didn't ask your name. Nanama. So Nanama said, things that are not within my control that can threaten my business. But it's not just things that are not within your control, but that will threaten your business. But those same things can also be opportunities for your business. And that's another thing that we need to realize, that what we see as a threat can also be an interesting opportunity. After all, isn't that the reason why, uh, whilst we hate the baller, somebody has made money from collecting the baller, right? And um, I like to use um, ZoomLine as a good example because the threat or the opportunity comes in different ways. But it is the lens with which you look at the environment that makes the difference, okay? So let's use the Zoom Lion example from more than 10 years ago. When Ejipon came into the system, there were garbage collection trucks. People came up with business plans that they can collect garbage. But he came with a plan that had a solution to a real problem. The problem was, whilst we have a lot of waste, we don't have containers to lift the waste. So what did he do? He said, the only way to lift the waste is to give people the containers. But Ghanaians, we don't like paying for, for things. Okay, so let's find a way. Let's give up the containers for free. But once people have containers, we can lift all the rubbish in this country. And that's what he did. He paid a price. Oh, he found a way to get his money back. But he took a very bold step. And do you remember those blue dustbins? At those times, I mean, those dustbins were costing uh, probably 300 Ghana, 400 Ghana cities in the market. Okay. And here you were, they are bringing it to your home and telling you that, oh, don't worry. Just bring your rubbish out every week and once he started the options were limitless and so it's about understanding the trends and developments in your environment not created by you but you really you don't control those those dynamics but they can feed your idea your business idea they can support your idea but they could also threaten your idea. Today, everybody's talking about the biggest threat of AI, all right? AI is a big threat. Why is it a big threat? Because it's coming to challenge everything we know and do. But my advice to people is to remind everyone of the time when, um, how many people here were allowed to use calculators in school? Oh. How many of you were allowed to use calculators in school? You are very fortunate. There was a time when all you had was something called a, a that green book, what was it called? Um, a log book. 
and I have a, a relative who chewed the whole thing and became mad, you know. But the calculator came, examiner said, oh, um, uh, you know, we can't allow people to use calculators, it's cheating, you know, it slows down the mind. All sorts of reasons why that new technology at the time was of no good to us. Today, we all use calculators and it's part of, right now, it's not even math sense. It's the calculator that the kids need. And it's a scientific calculator. And uh, right now, they don't even care about the calculator anymore because doing it on Excel is much easier. That's the world. That's the way of the world. And time and time again, human beings have shown how resilient they are with innovations. Knowledge. Knowledge is here to stay, and it will always help to improve the way we do things. So let's embrace the new things that are coming so that we don't get left behind. Today, it's easy for you to go online, and even you don't need me to come and stand here and talk about strategy. Just Google it. You'll find it. The only problem is you have to be passionate enough to read all the information and learn from it. And so there's still use for me for now. <laughs> but even I may, you know, my profession may be going extinct very soon, and I also have to wake up and adjust or adapt. Yeah. So the environment is very, very key. Do not play around with that exercise. It is not a simple exercise. You must really try and understand what is going on in the environment that can impact your business. Let me give you an example. So, uh, for all of you, next year is election year, right? You don't control elections. But do elections affect your, the different types of businesses you are in? Somebody here tell me why elections will affect their business. Why will elections affect your business? How? How in a people are not happy, they don't come out to buy. If people are not happy, they won't spend. Okay, that's one one reason. General government. Is there anybody who sees an opportunity in the election for their business? Yeah. General yes. government. Yes. Change of government when it comes. Change of government. What would that do for you? <laughs> Maybe the the new coming government has better policy for you. Maybe you may be in supportive of the new government, so you can get links. How many change of governments have you seen? <laughs> and how many of them have actually helped you? <laughs> Please, unless you've got that political link and you have that security that the business and contract is coming to you, please don't plan on change of government. It's a nice thing to say. And by all means, if you have the connections or the network, it may channel business your way. But that's an outlier. It may also be game changing for you, but please uh, don't depend on change of government. Those who are making money from change of government, they don't just sit there and wait, they actually do things before they get help. So just a piece of advice. So, uh, may I trust, trust in your capabilities and the markets that you, you have targeted out. If the economy is bad, it's bad for everyone. We all, we all swim in the same sea. So, what opportunity is there with the election? Um, I think those in the print and design business, they'll get more um, advantage in their t-shirts, billboards, and other souvenirs. True. People need those type of things. Yeah. And they need them. And the funny thing is, it is always an emergency. It's always an emergency. So what can you do today? to help you in 2024, when the time comes. It's the same with, um, who's, who's catering? How many people have catering businesses yeah. here? The supply of food, feeding people, and um, you know, whilst, and this time there's no money. This time there's no money. So um, people need to get innovative about how they solve those problems. Feeding polling agents, feeding, and, and, and here's another risk to any business. Who here has a business in the marketplaces? Who here are in the market 
the stores and so on. Who here has a business in the marketplace? Who here is at risk of um, riots affecting your shop or your business? Who here has that risk? No one? Well, you are fortunate. But these are all things that you have to anticipate. That what would the risk be to my business during elections? Um, it may mean that elections will, be a, will not be a peak period for my business. What are the implications then? What do I do differently? So understanding the developments and trends in your environment help you develop a very good SWOT analysis. So both in your internal environment and your external environment. Now, so the, the lesson here was identify your core competency and then change the playing field to suit your competency. Play where your skills work best. But the story still doesn't end. <laughs> Adra. And well, the hare and the tortoise by this time had become pretty good friends and they did some thinking together. Both realized that the last race could have been run much better. So they decided to do the last race again, but to run, but to run as a team this time. They carried off and this time, the hare carried the tortoise to the river bank. There, the tortoise took over and swam across with the hare on his back. On the opposite bank, the hare again carried the tortoise and they reached the finishing line together. They both felt a greater sense of satisfaction than they had felt earlier. You know, there's a group of people I shared this with and then somebody shouted, ah, then it's not a race. <laughs> but the question is, does it have to be? That's the question. And your two speakers this morning said it. It's about finding the right partners for whatever your vision is. Whatever it is that you want to achieve, do you have the right partner? And there is something fundamental to partnership here that is illustrated in the story. What is it? What is it? What is the fundamental thing that kept the partnership between the hare and the tortoise going? It's easier because we are playing on strength and weaknesses. Okay, so we 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 allowed each other to take the lead when it mattered. But what else? Collaboration. Collaboration? Anyone? Sharing of skills. Sharing of skills. Okay. Division, division of labor. Division of labor. Talking, okay. communicating. Yeah. I'm sorry, your name please? Evina. Evina, yes. They both played their part. No one tried to act. They both played their parts. Nobody tried to act smart. What does that mean? Using each other's strengths is what she They use each other's strengths, but there's, there's a word. Teamwork. Yes, there was teamwork. Great. But with that communication, that's the want. word that oh, oh. is the foundation of every relationship. Trust. 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 Oh. Trust. Trust. It's it is so it is so crucial in business. You need to work with people you trust. If you don't trust people, understand why you don't trust them and move on. Because if you develop partnerships with people you don't trust. What tends to happen is you spend too much of your time second guessing them and you waste a lot of time over simple transactions. Building trust and loyalty uh, takes time. You learn hard lessons, but trust is very important in business. And you yourself must be trustworthy. Uh, remember that you are the business owner and your leadership must be trustworthy leadership. Sheila said it this morning that when we start off as entrepreneurs, our focus is on the idea. But once you are a registered business, you are a business like every other business, which means you have responsibilities. Her definition talked about um, your economic role 
you are employing people. Please, if you are anybody here who has even one person under their employment, let's clap for them because you are helping the economy of Ghana. The re we say, I mean, we are helping people earn a living. Don't think that your contribution is too small, but you have to see how big a responsibility it is to factor it into your planning. So when you are planning, you are not just planning about the financial success, as in, I want to make 20 million, I want to make 100 million, I want to be number one. Remember that it is your people who are going to help you get there and you must carry them along from the very beginning. Some people learn hard lessons about people. Oh yes, people will let you down every now and then. Because the one weakness of the stereotype entrepreneur, I'm saying stereotype entrepreneur because there are a lot of things that people associate with entrepreneurs, is that they are so focused on the ideas and a lot of them do not get the benefit of learning how to manage people. There is a whole science to managing people and you need to learn how to manage people. If human beings are your most important resource, then you must know how to manage them. And you should not be afraid to ask for help. Most entrepreneurs bulldoze their way through because people are not listening to them. And rightly so. If people don't believe in your idea, you push them aside and go. That's what has also made entrepreneurs very successful. But once you own a business, you have to start thinking about structure. You have to start thinking about doing things right. The most successful entrepreneurs became successful or billionaires or millionaires not just because they had good businesses, but because somebody wanted to buy their business. One of the hard lessons business owners learn when they register a business and they start getting into the formal system is that um, GRA is on your case. You have to pay your workers. SNIT is on your case. Employers, we don't like SNIT and GRA. Uh, no, we don't. You know. But they are part, but once you're on the radar, you are part of the system. And so you have to get things right. Otherwise, you wake up one morning and GRE will come and find you a ridiculous amount of money and you say that I can no longer be in business. So you need to make sure that you are, you are sorting out all those little steps, checking all those boxes that will also make you a credible business. Otherwise, you'll find your business losing too much money. And that is why, again, when you have a business plan, your financials will show you that this is how much tax you're likely to pay in a year. But this is how much income you have projected you will make. And that's the nice thing about planning. When you see the numbers and you see the profits, then you say it's okay but you still have to find the ways to bring in that income. You have to develop strategies. Now, um, I'm supposed to be on till 10 minutes. There's a lot of information that I have, but, <coughs> excuse me. Probably the most important thing is I'll give you my slides. Um, when you go through the slides, you see that they speak to everything I said about the hair Okay, They actually speak to everything. But I just want to pick on a few for the sake of time. Um, as an entrepreneur, when you're developing your strategy, the most, one of the most important things is challenging the status quo, challenging what you are doing today. And this is what I've been doing for five years as an entrepreneur, I want to take my business to the next level. What do I need to do differently? 
I need to question the way we do things. I need to involve my team. I need to make sure that everybody in my, that contributes to my success. I have some in feedback or input from them to help me make decisions. What we do as consultants is to help organizations or people and businesses do that because sometimes you, the leader, are the problem. Sometimes you are the problem in your business. And so when you have a third party engaging you and your team, it makes it easier to uh, listen and appreciate the feedback they're getting. Uh, that is why normally when people are developing strategy, they use a third party. Sometimes the third party would be someone who's not associated with your business, who sits in that type of interaction and engagement so that they can look at things from a very unbiased point of view, all right? But typically, when you develop a strategy, Sheila had talked about you need a vision, you need a mission. All those are very important. They form part of the strategy development process. You must have a vision uh, as a business. But what is also important is the priorities you develop as a result of trying to soul search, okay? And so you have to question, to achieve your vision, how must your organization learn and improve? What are the things we need to do to get better, okay? And here you're talking about, this is your human resource base. Now, a lot of entrepreneurs, when they start off, don't rely on human resource management professionals to come into their business. But there's human resource advice you can get. Today, you can outsource your human resource needs. So I want to talk about finding the right person. Sometimes it's getting a company to recruit the right person for you. And then you onboard them and provide the right orientation to meet the standards that you set as a business. To satisfy your customers, you must ask yourself, which processes as I excel at? Business is always about continuous improvement. You can't keep doing, they say if you do what you've done, you'll get what you've got and worse. So you have to question, how are we improving the way we do things? If you've been doing the same thing for five years, something needs to change. Sometimes we are afraid to change, but sometimes the change will give us that room to grow. Customers, you don't have a business without customers. So what are you doing about customer experience? You must have priorities that are directed at customers. And in this business of, or in this day and age of service excellence, you always have to ask yourself, what is the customer looking for? What could I do differently? You yourself are a customer in so many different spheres and spaces. What are some of the things that you need? What are some of the things that you've seen that are changing because you are a customer? And um, Sewa also said that referrals were great, but while she got 80% of her customers from social media, what she didn't mention was that that 80% includes social media referrals because when somebody goes to your social media and they, they want to try you out, they look for the reviews and comments, don't they? Yeah. Even you, when you're looking for things to buy, you look for reviews and comments. Yeah. I mean, I never used to do it, but I want to say, ah, have you read the reviews? <laughs> and she'll come back with some reviews and I'm like, hey, my goodness. Yeah, I'm not that detailed. Uh, so those things influence people's choices. So just make sure that you are creating a situation where customers are doing the selling for you. That's the best form of, of marketing. Social media is a means to that end. And then financial perspective. Uh, Sheila said, pay yourself, right? Um, 
But then remember that if you are raising capital for your business, you may have other shareholders. And other shareholders need you to be accountable for the monies that they give you. So your financial performance is key. Financial performance is key. You must be constantly reviewing your progress. You must set targets for yourself. You must, and if you work with a team, the people in the team must know what those financial targets are. Sometimes we tend to hide how much money we make um, because uh, we don't want our staff to get greedy or think that they are entitled to the sweat that we've been through. But you know, whether you share with them or not, they'll still treat you the way they want to treat you. But when, when you bring them in and help them understand their place in it all, you stand a better chance of getting their support. There are some people who hears in distribution, um, who here does uh, product like uh, buy stuff from Nestle and Unilever? Is there anybody who does any of those things? I have an entrepreneur friend. He's a Unilever best distributor, but all his salespeople have stolen from him. They've all set up businesses uh, on his account, you know, because his people saw how much money he was making and saw that they could make money. So I told him, the next time you go into this business, give your people a stake in the business, otherwise they'll steal from you. Employees think they contribute a lot, and they do. Recognize the value of the people who work for you. Very important. But then also recognize that you are accountable to shareholders. Now, in the information that I'm going to give you about business planning, like I said, we talked a lot about business planning. There is something we call the business model. And it helps you break your business apart into pieces. So when I was saying get involved in writing your business plan, this template here will help you develop the content you need for your business plan. And you get a copy of this, all right? So you must think first, when you're developing your business plan, you must think of um, who are you targeting? What industry are you going into? And you ask questions like, who are the customers I am trying to create value for? And we have what we call the value proposition, where you say, what exactly am I offering these people? And these are questions you must answer yourself. What resources do I need to serve these customers? Who are the people I must call my key partners in this business that I'm in? So you answer all of these questions. And I'm telling you, you can write all the English you want to write for your business plan. But what this doesn't give you is the research for the markets that you're entering. And in, in, in developing a business plan, you need to convince the investor that there is a market for your product. That you have to convince the investor that there's a market for your product. But that involves going out there and getting the data. Some of it you can get online, some of it you have to pay someone to break anything. But there are resources to help you put together your business plan. You, your expectation of what's in the market helps you determine what kind of sales forecast you can make. So I can expect that by the end of 2023, I would have made out of so 200,000 units, 100 units, 20,000 units, based on my understanding of the markets and where I'm going for to place my business. I must look at what is happening in the marketplace, and then I must look at my actual performance. Over the last six months, how did I do? Most people are happy just to see the money they've made, but they don't look at the trend of how they did. Because when you do that, it informs you and helps you also think about what you could do differently for your business. 
I have given you an example of the uh, table of content. So in this document that um, Elaine will share with you, the table of content for all the different parts of the business plan, which you must consider. Okay. And you can do a simple five-page business plan just with this table of content. Um, when it comes to the need for an investor, then you need to give a lot more detail and also be able to make project that over the next five years, this is how much money I think I can make. And this is how much value you get for the investments that you make in the business. But you need a whole day for that. So um, I just want to leave you with my last slide, which says, whether you're developing a strategy or a business plan, you must do it with the right attitude and discipline. Discipline means staying focused and understanding the expectations of you. Um, I remember I was part of, you know, UT Bank that doesn't exist anymore. I knew UT Bank when they were in Kantamantu just lending money to people. We developed a business plan and a strategy for them. And it's from that strategy session that they said they wanted to become a bank in less than five years. And by 2020, 2010, they became a bank because they followed their plan. Their woes after that is more than just business. The important thing is, and Amwabe is an example of a very, very disciplined entrepreneur at the time. And it was just about having a passion, staying focused, and making sure that everybody you work with believe in what you believe in. To the extent that when people are speaking when you're in the house, you realize you can take that dream out from day that Sheila was talking about. Thank you all very much. Thank you.